got into contact with Rain a few days ago because I found out he was pretty close to having an arbitrary code execution set up in Paper Mario, but there were still a few roadblocks in the way of making that happen. After some research, I think I found a setup that'll work. The only thing it still relies on is hacking Mario's position so that he stands in a few really precise locations. Assuming that we can reach these locations with normal movement, then we will have arbitrary code execution in Paper Mario. If you're not interested in the technical explanation of why this works, you can skip ahead. I'm going to play a TAS movie at the end that demonstrates what this will look like just using the hacked positions. Anyway, I'll start with the file name. File names are stored in memory right here, and I'm going to put in a new name for file 2. It just wrote in there. And these three file names that I have set up, we're going to use to run as assembly instructions later on. The next thing is player 1's inputs. You can see the stick inputs right there. Those can make any value. And then in the upper two bytes are button inputs, and we can make most values out of these. Not absolutely everything, but pretty much anything we want. So we can use those to make assembly instructions as well. Player 3's inputs are right here. They are aligned in the same way as Player 1's inputs, so again we can make pretty much any instruction with those. Player 2 is here and Player 4 is there, and they're not aligned, so we can't do as much with them, and they're far less important. The final thing is this table, which you'll see filling up as I move around. This table has effects in it that are created by Mario moving or hammering. They're like the little dust particles, so that it gets filled in when they're created, and then when they end, it removes it. And that's really important, because with menu storage, these effects can be queued up, and they won't be created immediately, since some of the game is paused. So you can create all those effects, and then put the menu away, and they'll all get created at once. We can actually use this to cause a really good overflow, uh, but first let me just show that if I'm doing these effects, I can run this script to show the effects that are created, and uh, they have these matrices that they create with X, Y, and Z coordinates that we can manipulate based on Mario's position. So if I stand here, you'll see that these are the coordinates we expect to get. If I do a jump, and I'll run the effects again, and there we go, the same coordinates. So what can you do with that? Well, if I load this state here, you can see that uh, the effects queue is pretty much filled up. Uh, hammers do seven matrices, so we mostly use hammers, but it started with four jumps, which create three each. And it's important, at least, that the first one is a jump, I think. And also that the address it gets allocated to ends with 5-0. I'll explain that later. Uh, so now if I uh, move into a position, and I'll do one more jump. Nope, I created footsteps there by accident. Moved too quickly. So that's the position we should get. And we want the uh, matrix total to be at 25e, e, which is what it's at here. So now I will uh, set an execution breakpoint, not there, here, and close the menu. The effects are going to start running, and eventually the matrices for this jump will overflow right into this function that gets allocated by this first jump effect. Uh, so you can see if I look at this address. These are the matrix coordinates that we manipulated. So what can you do with this? Well, first of all, this uh, is executing in TLB map space, which I'm not super familiar with, but basically it's a different addressing space that doesn't have full access to like all the physical memory like the 8.0 space has. It's more just stuff that's loaded in as needed, I think for executing in kernel mode or something like that. So the problem that creates is that we can't just put in like a jump instruction because it'll try to jump to somewhere else in the E0 memory space, which is mostly empty. 
So we can escape back into the 8.0 addressing space, but to do that we need to run an instruction that jumps to a register. And uh, just with like one matrix, there's not enough that you can really manipulate to be able to do that. Uh, there's a couple other limitations as well, which I'll just briefly talk about once I recover from that crash. So the first thing is that due to how floating point rounding works, uh, to manipulate the Y coordinate, you need to come over to this tree and your X position is below 512 here which means that the x-coordinate of the matrix will round to the nearest 4. That, uh, that limits the number of instructions that you can do with it, so that kind of sucks. You can't, for instance, uh, load an immediate value into any register, only the even-numbered ones. So that's no good. What you can do um, is put a branch instruction into this top word that's made with the X and Y coordinate. And then with the Z coordinate, you can run a different instruction in the delay slot. But the limitation with the Z coordinate is that it's always just the top two bytes that you manipulate and the bottom two are fixed as zero, 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 zero. So that pretty much limits the number of possible instructions you can do and you can't load any immediate values that way. So there is a pretty limited manipulation that you can do, uh, but I did manage to find a way around that, and I'll show that now. So if I run this script, the total is at uh, 25e like we want it, but I've done six jumps here in very precise positions just to manipulate these matrix coordinates and do exactly what I want them to be. So now I will close the menu and pause like around right here. And I'm just going to put the stick into the right position, input D-pad up and C right, and then resume. And again, this has to, like, effects run for a bit. Eventually the matrices will overflow into here. And now we can step through the instructions that I wrote in. So it's going to branch, uh, but then it starts by storing the contents of V1 to this address. And that gets that C7 byte in there. Then it stores the lower half of A2 into the same address. So that gets the 02 byte right there. Then stores the bottom byte in K0. That gets a 0C byte. And then it has to uh, move T8, where it's been storing to, into the return address, which we can do. And then also, for this next instruction, we have to move A0 into the GP register. Because this one is really hard to manipulate, I couldn't find a way to store the byte from A0. I checked, like, every possible position. Uh, but anyway, we can store the byte in GP to this position, which is the final byte we need. And that puts that word in there. And then with the final Z coordinate, we can actually jump somewhere else in the TLB mount space, which is just a short function. I don't really know what this does, but the important thing is that when it ends, it jumps the return address, which is the address of that value we just set up. And this value is created just from stuff that's in the registers already. We can't load immediate values. But it just so happens everything we need is there to jump two steps back from player one's inputs. And these two instructions can run safely. Uh, so we reach player one's inputs, which because of what I'm holding now, is going to jump us into the save files. Okay, so we've reached the save files. What do we do now? Well, my plan uh, that I put together, my payload, revolves around having port 1 execute instructions while well, port 3 does these inputs I'm doing right now. So port 3 is going to jump back every time we run into it, it's going to jump back to the save file and port 1 is going to do different stuff. So right now the first thing that port 1 would have done is it would have set the value in the top half of uh, S2 I believe. So I'll just do that. It would set it like this, and then port 3 would have done the jump. 
and then we get into the save file. And the first instruction that I put in here calls the save game function. And that, if you heard just the audio there, it actually advanced a few frames, which means the inputs get pulled again. So we can change what player one is inputting and have it run a different instruction next time it goes into the inputs, which it's going to do now. We just set the bottom half of S2. Oh, I did mess up that command in this save state. It's supposed to be uh, like this. So I just have to set the value of S2 now. Uh, so it should be this value. We can get this value just from the inputs in the file name. And uh, once we do that, the third file name will jump to S2, which is back into player one's inputs. And right now, player one is just doing what player three would do, which is to jump back to the file name. And now we have a closed loop happening. So this can iterate as many times as we want it to, and it's going to advance frames and repull the inputs as it's doing so. So because of all that, we can have player one's inputs executing whatever instruction that we want on every iteration of the loop. And I wrote this payload to follow that, which I'm not going to do with inputs right now. I'm just going to paste it into memory to show what it looks like. So this is the first part of it. It loads this value into S0, which is just free memory that I can use. And then it starts doing this pattern of loading an instruction into the GP register and storing it there. So we're actually setting up a second loop with this. And once that's done, it, uh, it moves S1 over to here for the loop. It sets S0 to the base address of the effects table and it sets S3 to a value that'll be used to end the loop, and then it jumps to the code we just put in. And now we have another loop here. It jumps into this function, which removes an effect. So let me just get to the end of that. If I go back to the effects table, where do I have that? You'll see that the first effect has been removed now. So we continue like this. And every time this loop iterates, another effect gets removed. So eventually, it goes through and removes every single effect from the table. And that way, there's not an overflow anymore, and we can recover execution. So then, it goes back to the save file. And uh, let me just restore this and paste in the next part. And these are all instructions that controller 1 is able to execute. So when I play back the task at the end of this, that's going to be what happens. Controller 1 will be executing all of these instructions basically one at a time. There's a couple instances where Controller 2 is used when it can be, and Controller 3 at one point as well. But anyway, now we're going to set the room ID to 1, 0. So that's done. And we're going to load this argument in sort of a roundabout way into A0 and then call this screen transition function. And I should be able to just let that happen. And it goes back into the save when it's done because I incremented the return address. Restore that again. And the final instruction it runs is this jump, which is back to where it normally would have gone pretty much. This is where the uh, call was made to the TLB mapped function that we hooked into and I just jumped to the outside of this loop so that the function can end and now assuming I did everything right loading screen happens and we appear in the final end screen of the game so that's pretty much a full explanation of uh, how the payload works uh, it looks a little messed up because I have frame buffer emulation disabled and also I'm encoding this at 720p because it's what I had to do. So I apologize if the text is a little messy or hard to read. But anyway, now that I've explained that, I can play back a task movie. So I'll, uh, we'll screen this, hopefully that works. Yep, looks fine. So as Mario is hammering the ground a bunch of times here to fill up the effects queue, 
I just want to reiterate that this isn't quite the real thing yet because I need to hack Mario's position. I haven't reached those positions through natural movement yet. But that is the absolute last thing that we need to execute this, and the rest of this task movie is just normal gameplay. So Mario's just about done. Now his position is going to start being hacked, and he's setting up jump particles. That needs to happen six times in six really precise spots. And once that's done, you just close the menu, the code runs, and you reach the credits. So sorry if this got a little bit lengthy. Uh, I just wanted to do it in one take and kind of explain things as I went. Uh, but yeah, this is really exciting to me. I think it's pretty viable to reach these positions. Uh, I don't really know a lot about it, but I have high hopes for it. The thing is, I don't know if I'm really the right person to find these positions or how to get into them. I don't really know how to approach that problem, whether it's doing some math or writing a brute forcer or something like that. So I'm hoping that somebody will see this who knows how to help with that and it'll interest them enough because all the other pieces are in place. The only thing we need now is to get Mario into six float perfect positions, and we have arbitrary code execution in this game. The example payload I wrote, it just warps you to the credits, but you can iterate as many times as you want and run as many instructions as you want, so you could pretty much do whatever you want with this, assuming that we can just reach those positions. So yeah, that's going to be all for now. If you watch the whole thing, uh, thank you. Goodbye.